Greetings, everyone, and welcome to the Public Health Services and Systems Research Research in Progress series. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and as we do regularly, we've got um, some very interesting uh, uh, work in progress to share with you today. Um, it looks like we're getting a pretty good quorum of uh, um, attendees today. So I think um, in the interest of time, um, we'll, we'll go ahead and, and, uh, and get started. Um, I'm your host for today. I'm Glenn Mays, uh, the uh, director of our Cordang Center for Public Health Services and Systems Research. And um, uh, today we'll be hearing from some familiar faces for, for those of you who have been doing work in the world of public health services and systems research um, for, for some time. You'll certainly know um, uh, uh, many, if not all, of our, of our, um, our speakers today. This is uh, some work that is um, coming out of the great group of uh, systems and services researchers that are uh, based uh, at the Minnesota Department of Health and also at the um, University of, um, of Minnesota um, in, uh, in both uh, medicine and, and the, the public health school there. Um, so today we're going to be hearing uh, about research on the very important topic of uh, understanding points of connection between primary care delivery uh, in, in public health. This is a topic that is uh, obviously getting a lot of attention uh, these days as we move forward with implementation of um, uh, health reform initiatives under the Affordable Care Act and under state-based health reform strategies, uh, a number of the um, innovations that are, that are being tested for improving uh, health care delivery uh, from a quality and efficiency standpoint and from uh, the strategies for improving population health uh, on the public health side have to do with finding ways of better connecting and coordinating healthcare delivery uh, with public health programs and policies and strategies. And the primary care um, uh, delivery system is, is a place where those, um, those connections can, um, can be very meaningful. So um, we'll be hearing today from uh, Dr. Kim Guerin um, and uh, Dr. Beth Gilstrom, who are both um, uh, researchers in the Minnesota Department of Health. Uh, both Kim and Beth are um, ringleaders in the practice-based research network movement in public health as well, and our, our leaders within the Minnesota Public Health PBRN. One of our um, um, uh, leaders in the PBRN uh, arena. Uh, and uh, they'll be joined also uh, by Dr. Rebecca Pratt, who is um, a uh, professor at the, at the University of Minnesota in the Department of Family Medicine you know, and um, in community health. Um, so uh, we'll have uh, these, this, this research team um, step us through some of their research in, in progress now under this, uh, under this uh, research project, which was funded. Uh, this, actually, this, this particular research project was not funded through our PBRN mechanism, uh, as I recall, but actually was funded through the investigator-initiated uh, research program in public health services and systems research. Um, and uh, so we'll be hearing about this, this work that is uh, still underway and, and what the uh, research team is beginning to, to learn. After that, we'll, we'll hear from uh, some commentary as well from another one of our leaders in, um, uh, in the PhD world as well. So I'll, I'll wait to introduce her uh, for a little bit later. So this time, I'm going to turn the stage over to uh, Dr. Gearin and colleagues. Great. Thanks, Glenn. This is Beth Gilstrom in Minnesota. I'm going to start us off, and then um, I'll be passing things on to Rebecca and to Kim. But um, we're really pleased to be on the webinar today, so thank you so much for joining us. As uh, Glenn mentioned, we are a grantee of the Public Health Services and Systems Research Program uh, through the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, so very appreciative of that funding. But also want to acknowledge the local public health directors and the local clinic medical directors and staff who have participated in the interviews, the results of which we'll be sharing today, but also who participate on their practice-based research networks and have really provided guidance on the implementation of the study. Um, I think another really great aspect of this study is while Minnesota is in the lead, it is really a collaborative 
partnership between primary care and public health practice-based research networks across four states. So I did just want to take a moment and acknowledge our partner state investigators from Colorado, Washington, and Wisconsin. You'll see we have the public health crew across the top, and actually uh, Betty Beckmeyer will be providing the commentary later, and she's really well poised to do so because she's been playing an integral role in the study to date. And then also our primary care um, and co-investigators kind of along the bottom. So wanted to acknowledge that part of this has been the study itself, and part of it has really been building these collaborative um, working relationships between the researchers. So I'm sure this isn't a new um, visual for any of you, but when this came out, you know, we had talked a little bit with our colleagues at the University of Minnesota and said, boy, it would be really great to work on something together. But the other thing that it, that it really did is it elevated for us this need to really understand, monitor, and track the level of primary care public health integration. And really the focus for us is at the local jurisdictional level. So we're trying to get a feeling for across these four states, what does integration look like locally? So our purpose really then was to develop measures and use them to identify differences in integration, identify factors that would facilitate or inhibit integration, and then examine the relationship between that extent of integration and services and outcomes in select areas. And we, we chose immunizations and then tobacco use and physical activity as a focus. So just quickly, our, our research questions, you know, how does this degree of integration vary across local jurisdictions? Again, the facilitation and in, in how are we inhibiting integration, and how then can primary care and public health leverage any of those facilitating factors to increase working together on things? Does the degree of integration differ based on health topic, and do areas of greater integration have better health outcomes? So just to kind of um, put you in where we are in the process, this is a three-year study. We just wrapped year one, and we're really at the stage of doing our qualitative results dissemination and also gearing up for the quantitative portion of the study that is coming soon. Um, we really feel like the results of the qualitative study are both interesting in and of themselves, but they're also really informing the next phase. So today we really wanted to take some time to talk about the qualitative component of the study. We interviewed five pairs of key informants engaging a public health director and a primary care representative, but from the same jurisdiction. So we were really looking to get both of those perspectives within one local jurisdiction. So that works out to 40 interviews total across our four states with 10 in each state. We uh, identified our emerging themes very systematically, but the coding was done independently of theoretical models. And Rebecca will talk a little bit more about how those models um, have played into the work. But just to know that the results presented initially really were independent. And then as I mentioned, it's really contributing to all of our research questions. So at this point, I am going to um, turn this over to Rebecca Pratt, and she will walk through our findings. Thank you for that, um, Beth. It's great to be here talking about this project today. Um, it's, it's a delight trying to um, summarize the, the extent of the findings we've had in this qualitative phase of the project. Um, one of the things that has been so um, very wonderful is we've asked folks who have a working knowledge of each other in primary care and public health, who have experience of each other, to talk about um, what that relationship means to them and how it looks. Um, so we've been able to ask them to really think about examples of the work that they do um, and to talk us through what it means to come together and work together. Um, and we have, um, with the wonderful efforts of all the partners in the project, also just had an incredible wealth of information um, uh, that hopefully we can do some justice to in this project. It's, a, it's been very great to work on this data. So one of the things that we asked people to describe to us um, was, you know, was this idea about how public health and primary care, um, as we started out asking, how they integrate together. And so one of our um, early findings was the word integration is widely disliked um, and not helpful in relation to advancing the conversation about pri public um, 
health and primary care working together. So we have found that um, collaboration is really much more broadly preferred as a term in terms of how folks work together um, as opposed to the word integration itself, which seems to, um, for some people, imply certain levels of structural change that we weren't necessarily talking about, um, as opposed to getting people to talk about what it means to work together. So, and in that sense, we asked people to describe the very many varied ways that they did work together and all the variation in that collaboration that they may have working together. And what's been unique about this sample is that while it may not be representative, um, what we have sought to do is get a very broad range of experiences. So folks that do know each other, but some partnerships may have had more success working together than others. So people were able to talk about not only what went well when they collaborate, but when some of the things were challenges. So the key components that emerged through our qualitative interviews um, in relation to what was important for collaborating together, some of these are, are not very surprising. Some of them are things that we might expect and we see in many of the models that have been done already in this area. So for example, aligned leadership would be one that we might expect to see. Um, people also talked and described having formal processes as um, an important part of collaborating. And so that might be the ways in which groups are set up to work together. For some, some folks that might involve the use of subcontracts or formal roles on committees or delivering services. Um, it was interesting that people did um, describe, and we'll talk a little bit more about this later, about the important um, about the important role of co-location for formalising some relationships that different groups had with each other. Two aspects of um, collaboration emerged as particularly important as we had these conversations uh, with people in the community. And one of those was the idea of having a commitment to a shared strategic uh, vision. And this emerged where people had been quite successful in working together and collaborating. And examples of this might be what we um, suspect is an, an increasing number of um, shared community health needs assessments where you might see the health partner and the public health partner coming together um, to develop shared strategic visions for the work that they do. Now some of that might have been spurred on by changes in tax related requirements, especially for non-profit hospitals. But where that has happened, there's been quite a mutual benefit in conducting those various required assessments together although that's certainly no, no easy feat. One of the things that emerges um, also as being really central to the ability to develop a shared strategic vision is being able to share and analyse data together um, and being able to work with that shared information to identify data-driven priorities. And obviously that, that plays a, a quite important role in being able to come up with a shared strategic vision. Um, it also highlights where there's all sorts of wonderful potentials for um, primary care to perhaps have a lot of data but not always necessarily the expertise to work with that data and public health often having a lot of expertise they can bring to that process and making meaning of the data. So really interesting examples of that role of having that shared data and analysis and developing those shared strategic visions. Um, sustainability emerged as, as an important um, item in relation to collaboration. Um, but one of the things that did emerge that perhaps um, surprised us a little bit was the way in which people described the, the importance of opportunity for developing collaborative relationships and working together. Now when people describe opportunity, it's perhaps in two different ways that it's described. And one of those opportunities that was mentioned quite frequently would be an example of H1N1, when there might be a time where there's a pressing community-wide need um, that has a certain urgency that brings people together to, to work with a pressing um, issue. Um, for others, opportunity might come about in the, in the, in the form of having shared funded projects um, that they work together on proactively. But the role of opportunity um, was clearly quite important for people getting to know each other and developing some really foundational um, experiences of each other that could help build their relationships. Um, on the flip side of that, it's not that we would um, suggest that infectious um, uh, disease was a really good strategy for promoting collaboration in the community. Um, but on the other hand, 
Um, since in some ways there is a certain amount of predictability about things like outbreaks, what this does draw attention to is making the most of those times um, as a way to see what foundational building blocks can be explored that come out of those intense times of working together. Um, we found that um, partnership was important and we'll talk a little bit more about the different aspects of that in a moment. But also the collaboration context is important. One of the things that um, was quite clear in talking to folks is that there's a real sense of, an, of energy and enthusiasm in this moment in time in terms of anticipated changes with health reform um, from the primary care side of things, but, but also in public health too, the idea that there may be changes in, in that field too. So while those um, changes and challenges and, and reforms can present some barriers to a certain extent um, in terms of making it a, a quite busy and complicated time to work together, it does seem to have generated quite a lot of enthusiasm and sense that there may be different ways to explore working together. Um, now, just to talk a little bit more about this idea about partnership, um, we asked, it was quite clear in the data that people talked about this in lots of different kinds of ways and so um, we felt it was important to break down this idea about partnership and think about the different aspects to that that are important to people. Um, because partnership itself, as a, as a word we would all agree, partnership's a good thing, but what exactly about it uh, is important? Um, a really central idea that's important around the idea of partnership is having communication. And, and by communication, that really means some really committed, long-term connecting with each other and communicating about um, what each other is doing, the work that you're doing and the opportunities uh, that are available. Communication was mentioned time and time again as being very central to developing key collaborations together. In terms of other things that we have um, expanded on in relation to this idea about partnership, we see that having um, mutual awareness of each other is important. Um, but by this, um, it's, we really mean a kind of a deep mutual awareness, really having an understanding of what each um, field or discipline brings to a partnership. Um, so for public health, having a really deep and meaningful understanding about primary care, what it can and can't do and its challenges, but likewise for um, primary care to actually have uh, a really good understanding about what public health brings to the table too. Um, and for some folks um, that was really seen as a, a central aspect of being able to have the foundation required to collaborate. Uh, it was clear that having um, the ability to have a history over time is important for people. So it's a patient and ongoing process in terms of developing collaborations. And that does really highlight how valuable it can be to have points of joint focus or joint projects over time for partners to continue to develop and build that relationship. It's no, it's no one point in time achievement. Um, people did talk about the role of having shared values in terms of having a shared commitment to do work that um, a re that really has the ability to think about patients in the relation to their experience at a community level too. So having that shared, those shared values about understanding the value of coming together and working for those purposes was important. Uh, as was the idea of having uh, respect for each other and being able to take time to celebrate the successes of what can be uh, a very challenging um, and tough endeavour. Now in, in this um, research we asked people to describe the way in which they worked in a kind of narrowly defined topic in particular around the idea of working together around immunisation and we asked people to describe times in which they worked together about a broad, more broad topic um, such as the idea of cardiovascular risk. Um, it does seem that it has been perhaps more straightforward to work together in relation to the more narrowly defined topic areas, certainly in relation to um, immunisation. Um, when we ask people to describe their current areas of work that they do collaborate on, immunisation really is quite universal in terms of the points of contact public health and primary care have. Um, in saying that, um, people also are quite commonly working in the area of cardiovascular disease risk reduction 
infectious disease, mental health and obesity. So there's a really broad, uh, broad range of work that's currently happening. But overall, we would emphasise that those, those really um, defined areas such as immunisation have been more straightforward for people to work together on. We also asked people about areas of work that they would like to work on in the future. Um, and in that, we see um, mental health um, was one that really stood out um, as people mentioning being part of their future priorities and what they felt was important for collaborating together on in their areas as well as obesity, smoking cessation, environmental health and emergency preparedness. Um, so what we, what we do see from that is there's just a tremendous range of work happening between public health and primary care. Um, and while there are some challenges to, to doing the more broadly defined um, work, such as cardiovascular risk together, there's certainly a, a great range of work, perhaps with some emphasis on, on devel developing work beyond immunisation in the future. We explored with our participants what were the key kinds of um, things that really helped facilitate being able to work together and some of the ways in which there were barriers for working together. Um, and, and in that sense it was very useful to have a, a data sample where there were stories of more challenging relationships as well as just successes. Um, so some of the um, more frequently mentioned barriers were things that we might expect quite easily, such as a lack of resources or poor communication. But what was um, quite striking was um, a key barrier to working together was very fre frequently described as having a lack of understanding each other. And this, this again shines a light on the importance of attending to that part of developing a partnership. Um, and uh, while, you, while there might be the ability to resolve things like resources and communication, if there's not a really good understanding um, of, of each partner and the work that they do and what they bring to the table, it could really undermine the potential to work together. Now that does also highlight um, the concern that there's a lack of opportunities to do cross-training, which of course would be one of the ways in which an understanding of each other um, could be improved. Um, and for some folks, the, the, the barriers were as large as needing to entirely change the systems that we work in. For some um, of the facilitators that were described that were seen to be very um, useful for working together, we see the emergence of co-location um, as being quite useful for some um, partners. And, and some examples were given of how it really transformed relationships to need to kind of, um, through, through planning or circumstance, uh, share physical space together. Um, that ability to build on opportunity, again, another very useful facilitator, as well as having a previous, uh, a previous working relationship and dedicated staff time. So these are some of the facilitators and barriers that we explored. Now we asked um, people um, to say how much they felt it is beneficial to even work together at all. Um, and public health was quite resound in its response that it's always beneficial to collaborate together um, to improve health outcomes. And primary care described both a good level of commitment to it always being beneficial, but also this context of having a lot of competing demands um, and working out how to integrate uh, working with public health in, in the context of, of having many um, demands currently on them. Uh, so it's also quite clear that it's quite difficult to measure or assess the ways in which that benefit can be shown, particularly the more broad um, the topic. So that's a uh, sort of a whistle-stop tour of some of the findings that we had. Um, we really had such a wonderful depth and breadth. And we made a choice to work with that data um, blind to the um, models that are currently um, describing the idea of collaboration or integration between public health and primary care. And so in that sense, this was just our take on this from, from a fresh perspective, looking at this data that had both positive and negative examples. And then we've taken that, um, that work and brought it to um, trying to think a little bit about how this relates to the very many frameworks that are out there. 
So this is what we call the cross work and walk. And that's a very teeny tiny slide. Um, I promise it's not there deliberately to annoy you, um, even though it's a little bit annoying, the, the, uh, the smallness of it. Um, if you're interested to see that in greater detail, um, I do see that the slides are available for download on the webinar. But in essence, um, what we um, did was we took all of these wonderful models that have been developed, but are, all have slightly different focuses and um, work in slightly different ways, and summarise which broad domains they include in their model and which ones they don't. And this is what this crosswalk looks like. Um, and so this is, this is our summary, uh, broadly bringing in the models that are together throughout the field. And the next question for us was how well does the work that we do relate to what we see in the current frameworks available. Um, again, this is another slightly um, glitzy slide, but what it does, for example, is show how we were able to take our qualitative data um, and cross-code it in relation to the main conceptual areas that exist across all frameworks and see where we had um, areas of activity in our framing, our, our, our coding in relation to the current frameworks. And you can see that there's some areas where there's gaps and there's some areas where there's a lot of activity. And that gave us some um, idea that we needed to explore a little bit more how our data relates um, with the current uh, frameworks that are available. So um, just as a, as a recap, uh, we initially went in blind to the models um, and then conducted our own fresh analysis of key themes in the, in the areas and then brought that to the models that are existing and considered how they relate to this crosswalk. And this is, this is what it looks like um, when we go through the process of looking how our data relates to the crosswalk. And you can see it's, it's, it's not a uniform picture. There's areas of agreement and there's areas of difference. Um, and so I'm going to display this in hopefully a slightly more visible way. So what we were able to do was take the um, the areas that we have um, seen a lot of convergence with, with, with our qualitative data. Um, and on the top line there you can see those are the areas that are represented in our qualitative data. And the areas that didn't yield a lot of overlap from their previous crosswalk model were, um, and they may sound surprising, partnership, goals and objectives, and performance and evaluation. And um, that's not to say that those aren't present or important in, uh, in the work that we have done, but I think what our qualitative data has highlighted is that it may be time for a slightly more nuanced understanding of some of these concepts in terms of how to operationalise them. So while they may be uh, present in, in other models and very good descriptions of something that's important, what we're hoping to bring um, with our framework is how to um, further expand on some of those concepts so we can think through how we can encourage partnership building with, with greater detail. And also some new areas we have suggest might be useful in frameworks such as this idea about opportunity. And as we've been wrestling with this um, increasing development of a framework, this is one way that we have um, been able to conceptualise it that's helped us get to get to grips with how our model right, might relate to the interface between public health and primary care. So we see here we have many ideas that we have brought and developed um, to the idea of frameworks. But what we're proposing is that perhaps some of these concepts are broadly essential in relationship between public health and primary care, such as those ones we might expect. And we see those on the left-hand side, mutual awareness and so forth. But um, public health and primary care have points of contact. Uh, for example, they may come together as a point of contact in relation to patient-centred aspects, such as delivering care. Um, and they may exhibit certain um, aspects of the framework that are more relevant to that point of contact. We might see that there's organisational and system level points of contact between public health and primary care, which might resonate with different aspects of the model, and likewise for population and community level. So what our journey has taken us through is the idea that perhaps there might be some benefit in expanding some aspects of current models, thinking about things that haven't been in the model before which have emerged in the field, but thinking about too how they relate in relation to these different contexts and point of contact across 
the relationship between public health and primary care. And this work has been a really important aspect for us to think about how we proceed onwards with this work to think about um, our quantitative phase of the study and how we, um, how we then start to assess are these aspects um, the ones that we do think are important to these different levels of care and how do, we, how do we understand how this might relate to health outcomes. So that's an awful lot of information uh, to give you all at once. Hopefully that has been at least um, coherent enough you can see where our work is, is, is evolving to through this, through this process. And now I'm going to hand over to Kim to talk a little bit about uh, some of our conclusions and where we're heading next. Hello everyone. So just to recap, in this qualitative phase of our study we've conducted 40 interviews with paired primary care and public health executive leaders who have a range of experience working together. And our interviews suggest several key characteristics that support working together across primary care and public health. Rebecca spoke about aligned leadership, commitment to shared vision, data sharing and analysis. She noted some key barriers, especially related to communication, limited mutual understanding and resources. Some of these findings reinforce or elevate themes in, a, in the existing literature. And additional findings really contribute, I think, some important nuance and additional insight. I'm thinking here about her remarks on opportunity or orientation to innovation. So some of the practice conclusions that are starting to surface. It really seems that systematic long-term efforts are going to be needed to overcome a pretty fundamental lack of understanding. Leaders from both primary care and public health felt misunderstood that counterparts didn't really understand culture, uh, the culture of their organizations, their disciplines, their, the demands they faced, the strengths they could bring. Primary care clinics and local health departments are also likely going to need some intentional opportunities and tangible expectations to come together. We can't count on these sorts of relationships to just happen. At the same time, there's a place for seizing opportunities that arise through outbreaks, economic downturns, or other crises that seem to fairly predictably surface over time. So practitioners can imagine new possibilities and be ready to innovate as opportunities arise. And there's also just an opportunity for leadership. Practitioners can create opportunity by stepping forward to convene primary care and public health leaders in their communities. So to highlight a couple of limitations, this was a qualitative study with five primary care public health pairs sampled across 40 states, for four states, or for 40 respondents. Our informants weren't necessarily representative, but were sampled to assure a range of experience working together. And to minimize bias from individual perspective, we used a shared process of interpretation across states and disciplines. And it's probably also worth noting that um, we had a primary care and a public health representative jointly leading each interview. So in closing, we feel very fortunate to have assembled a strong team of primary care public health researchers and practitioners and to see how this study is serving to build research relationships within and across our states. And of course, we're especially grateful to our PBRN partners, the National Coordinating Center for Public Health Systems and Services Research, and the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. So on behalf of my co-presenters, I'd really like to thank you for your interest and attention. Fantastic. Thank you so much um, to the, the great team from, from Minnesota for this, this work. Um, I know we're going to have lots of questions and discussions uh, about, about this work and, and thinking about where it's leading in the future, but before we open it up for that, um, we want to hear um, some expert commentary from one of our uh, other fellow travelers in the PHSR world. Um, let me just say that um, 
Uh, let me invite you to go ahead and be thinking about your your questions now, and, and uh, we're going to want to want you to use the uh, the chat box um, if you can to, to type those in here in a moment. Uh, but before we do that, let me introduce uh, Dr. Betty Beckmeyer from uh, the University of Washington and our uh, our PPRN to um, uh, to uh, uh, kick us off with some commentary. Okay, thanks, Glenn and um, Beth and Kim. That was fantastic. It was. It's great to hear um, hear your overview of this study, and um, and all of you are um, that uh, presented this. But uh, it's it's great to hear this, and I know people are very eager for these findings. My colleagues around here in Washington run into. Um, issues all the time for which they want to better understand um, how to leverage partnerships and how to make the most of um, responding to um, our uh, changing milieu, the context around the Affordable Care Act, around budget cuts, et cetera, and how to be most responsive in their communities. So I'm frequently sort of mentioning this study and, and um, Thing that's talking about these preliminary findings and that there's more to come. A couple um, quick comments I'd like to also throw in is sort of my own experience in being one of the PI pairs here in um, in Washington. Um, of course, I'm uh, representing the public health PBRN side, but working with my primary care PBRN colleague, Laura Mae Baldwin here in Washington has been a real gift in relationship to being a part of this study. Um, it's really opened up, um, I'd, I'd like to think, both of our eyes in terms of um, possible collaboration and what one another does and what our PBRNs do and how they operate um, very differently in some ways and, and in some ways similarly, as well as some of the challenges. And then also, we, in our case, we conducted um, all these interviews together and um, had uh, a lot of eye-opening experiences just in terms of learning about our, ourselves, learning about one another's um, uh, fields and the practitioners we work with very closely and, um, and some of their uh, challenges, experiences, opportunities, and what's really worked well. So that's been a real gift in relationship to this work. Um, it's also been... Um, one thing I can tell you I've been eager to hear about is is looking at, um, you know, I'm really interested in what are the, some of the structural factors and features, things that are modifiable um, that uh, will suggest implications for this study for, for practice and for policy making. Um, and in particular, you know, we, we um, have done a lot of work um, in looking at and talking about and developing, um, and perhaps never enough, but, um, but public health leaders and public health leadership. Um, I was also interested in, in hearing and seeing what factors beyond the specific individual people are making um, some of the, um, um, some of the um, real, seemingly the best practices really flourish. We heard a lot, um, Laura May Baldwin and I did, about um, certain um, settings in our uh, state that were, were had some really amazing activity going on that neither one of us quite realized because we were both sort of seeing it from our, through our own lens, through our own sectors. Um, but, um, you know, sometimes you hear about They'll, they'll talk a certain degree about it's because of so-and-so that's really made this happen. Um, and we want and need more of those so-and-sos. So looking at that and what those um, um, leadership qualities are, but also beyond that, what are factors, other factors that are also modifiable in our systems that we can look at. Um, some questions I'll just throw out there that um, that maybe my colleagues from Minnesota can respond to or can be part of the discussion are um, are looking at um, you know hearing more about the how our um, pra practice partners in primary care and public health are leveraging the context of the Affordable Care Act of, of perhaps budget cuts um, as a benefit to 
um, cat a catalyzing um, stronger collaboration or um, or undermining, you know, and what are the ways they are really mo taking greatest advantage of this. Um, also, I was struck that in looking at the model, um, the model elements that really, I really love the bar charts um, that showed what model elements really kind of resonated um, most with the findings. But was a little struck that community engagement didn't seem to show up, if I'm understanding that correctly. That would have seemed a big one, but maybe it's part of that more nuance needed um, point that you all made um, that we'll get to perhaps with, with further research. Um, and I was also kind of interested in the question about, um, you all talked about the benefits of collaboration were perceived both with primary care and public health, but came out really strong with public health. And did that mean that it was less strong um, in primary care? So that there is kind of a, um, maybe a interesting difference there that we'd have to um, get over in order to, a hump that we'd have to get over in terms of really um, uh, facilitating um, stronger partners or collaboration. So I guess I'll leave it at that and uh, lob it back to you, Glenn. Fantastic. Thank you so much, uh, Betty. Um, <clears throat> so I think at this time we are open for uh, questions and comments from the field. So um, given the um, given the, the large crowd that these uh, research and progress talks attract, it's um, a lot easier if you can use the uh, chat box to post your questions and comments. I will try to moderate those. And um, let me see here. Let me go back up. We've got a couple of here. Uh, um, so first question from Laura, um, Laura Hutton, and she asked, what's the next step? How um, will the, uh, um, the new more nuanced framework um, and, and kind of cross-cutting framework analysis be used to um, be, be developed and used, and how, um, how, might it, how are you planning to use it specifically in the quantitative uh, phase of your study? So any uh, thoughts from the team on that one? Sure, thanks, Laura. Um, really, the framework is it, we're using it as a guide as we are developing the quantitative um, survey questions. So um, we have a study advisory committee that has the primary care and public health representatives from each state who come together and um, they are really going to be fundamentally um, involved in making sure that we are tapping into and, and hopefully able to get at some of the nuance that, that has been elevated through the qualitative. Results. Excellent. We've got a question from Kasuma Madala um, and asking if you can share more about how you identified um, your respondent, the, um, uh, especially the primary care representative, uh, and, and also how you selected um, which uh, jurisdictions um, you, um, you interviewed or you, you, you used to select your, your respondent. Sure. Um, so in each state, um, the PIs represent um, the PBRNs from both the primary care and the public health worlds. And so the process for identifying those dyads um, was a process of you know, uh, leveraging the, the non-contacts through both PBRNs in terms of folks who would be interesting or willing to participate um, in research and be able to talk about this with the goal of um, approaching dyads that would represent a range and, and breadth of experiences. So the focus wasn't just on, a, you know, focusing just on um, folks who were outstanding or had best practice, but for a range of people who could talk about their knowledge of each other. So um, primary care is pretty um, challenging to recruit through. Um, that, is, that is a for sure, but using our primary care PBRNs, um, was really the key for facilitating the recruitment for dyads. And I would just add, you know, we tried to get a variation in the types of local jurisdictions so that we had, um, you know, smaller, larger, more urban, more rural, you know, really tried to get a, kind of a sampling, so to speak, across the states. 
we we weren't though you know we didn't necessarily target jurisdictions where we where we thought just based on our knowledge that there was absolutely nothing going on so that's that's in part you know as Kim talked about a limitation that this you know wouldn't necessarily be representative because we did actually want to have something to talk about in the interviews so so there is probably a slight skew to these um, where we where we tapped into jurisdictions where we thought, okay, well, they are going to have something to say, and there was certainly variation in that, um, but but didn't necessarily target those who would say, well, we actually have no idea who each other is at all, and, and you know, really it would have been kind of a not very interesting interview for us. Excellent. Uh, we have another question um, that um, applauds uh, this project's efforts to synthesize the different frameworks here, and I definitely agree with that. You, that's, that's really valuable work in and of itself. Um, the question, um, in your framework, can you characterize what the characteristics for items represent, uh, in, I guess, in the, cro in the crosswalk of, across the frameworks? Um, are those elements features of the collaboration, uh, or are they facilitators slash barriers to collaborations, uh, or both? What were, the, what were the characteristics, what were the nature of the characteristics that you were uh, classifying across these things? Yeah, so um, the answer really could be all of the above, um, and that what the crosswalk does was provided a summary of uh, really the key aspects um, that we see across the very, you know, there's really quite a large number of models um, there. So, um, and and I'm sure that our slide was very hard to, to read, but for example, some of those key aspects um, are vision, mission, and values. So where um, a model referred to those, and, and we made some, uh, some sort of discretion choices about how to group together related themes, because each model does uh, tend to have its own way of um, expressing things too, to find common aspects of models and characterise it that way. Um, and in re so in relation to the crosswalk, that's, that's what those characteristics represent. In relation to what we've brought to it though, um, it's, really our, um, it's really our kind of broader or major themes and our major thematic, character, uh, uh, our major thematic categories that have emerged through working with the qualitative data, which just have emerged and developed to have a certain resonance with the um, with many of the aspects of current frameworks um, and and some differences too. So it's really you know it characterises really a lot of different things. And and for some of those things they're barriers, and for some of them they are facilitators. When we have when we have a characteristic in a model that's communication, for example, um, communication done well can be a, a facilitator, and done poorly can be a barrier. So. So each of these things can really represent a number of different aspects when we think about how we come to translating this into those modifiable um, areas to improve practice. I hope that answers your question. Fantastic. Very good. Um, oh, this is a good. This is one. This is a question um, I was wondering about as well uh, from uh, Hao Ben Lau. Uh, um, the question is: Do your did your interviewees indicate any um, evidence of competition uh, uh, for primary care between um, public health agencies and uh, and FQHCs in particular? I've certainly seen that evidence of that in, in certain um, in certain communities. So thoughts there? Yeah, um, I, you know, I would say that the that the tone of the data that we have, I, I do understand that that does um, describe something that happens in relation to public health and and particularly FQHCs in relation to um, having shared patient populations and some of the confusion and difficulties or challenges that causes. But there was also a very strong tone of of those being potential areas of um, you know where enhanced collaboration could achieve so much more. So I think overall the tone was very collaborative about the potential, um, but certainly in some areas that does present some challenges. Yeah, and I would, I would add, you know, certainly for example here in Minnesota, we are not, um, our public health isn't a very clinically oriented system. Um, so that might be a difference. Uh, with other states that do do a lot more direct service provision. Um, Minnesota has 
um, really, I think, shifted at its focus to, say, working closely with, with service providers to try and make sure that people are receiving care, but have kind of stepped out um, and have moved away from that to some degree. Um, like an example would be um, some of our local practitioners would talk about if they are doing a lot of immunizations, they feel that's basically a failure of our healthcare system. They're, they would like to see um, primary care or pediatrics providing those immunizations and public health being more in a supporting role. So I don't know if that also colors, you know, the way in which some of these states kind of function in terms of how they deliver public health, it may have changed a little of the tone, um, tone of the interviews. Does that help? That, that, that's a great observation, Beth. And actually, um, that was a, you know, another question or comment I was going to ask in, related to that. You know, as, as we look at as more um, public health agencies are looking at scaling back some of their direct service provision and, and clinical services delivery, one concern that is sometimes voiced in that movement is, is um, agencies that, that, that scale back clinical services delivery, is that going to, um, you know, is that going to inhibit their ability to, to maintain strong relationships with the, with the, um, you know, the primary care community if they're no longer kind of in, in the game of, of direct service provision? And, and I guess the setting you just described in terms of Minnesota, and the fact that you're still finding lots of points of connection is perhaps, um, you know, offers some insight into that. Um, that, that kind of concern, that there's certainly um, other realms of, of collaboration and interaction um, between these, these, um, these stakeholders that, uh, that don't necessarily have a around public health role in, in clinical service delivery. It, it may actually free up public health to do, to assume more of a convening role. They're doing less in the clinical realm. Yeah, and I, I would um, add to that, that, that is something that did come through in the findings that um, uh, for some areas public health had the ability to be able to be, if you like, sort of the neutral party between health systems or health providers who might be, um, you know, working in a competitive environment um, and saw public health as the neutral convener in the room. Um, so so that, could, that could well be one thing that developed. Although the other thing that was probably a little bit concerning, I think there was one uh, primary care provider who felt that what public health had to offer they could more easily take care of themselves and, and that would be really too bad um, to see primary care attempting to do public health outside of having collaboration. So that's another potential concern. Excellent point. Um, very, very good observations. Um, so it looks like we may have uh, exhausted our uh, our supply of um, questions and comments for for today. I, I will one of the one of the thing I wanted to just encourage you to do is just you know recognizing that this study is still in midstream. I think um, again the, the qualitative work that you've done already uh, and, and combined with the framework analysis is very very powerful uh, work. I, I I would encourage you to. Um, um, to go ahead and, and think about disseminating and publishing that, that work, um, uh, you know, I know that you've done it primarily uh, to, to inform subsequent phases of your, of your study, but there's, there's likely to be, um, I know there will be a, um, a lot of demand for this, this kind of work. That, that framework analysis in particular, um, uh, perhaps uh, think about uh, publishing that and, and filtering that back to framework developers. But I think the framework developers themselves would be very interested to uh, see with greater clarity the points of connection uh, to, to other, other frameworks um, nationally as well as at a state level. State health improvement plan. Um, so with that, so, so again, I want to thank, um, thank our, our uh, colleagues from um, Minnesota uh, Health Department and University of Minnesota and our, our uh, Betty Beckmeyer, our, our um, expert commenter for today. Thank you all for joining us as um, uh, part of this, this session. A few, um, a few closing um, reminders and, and remarks. Uh, one is that um, don't, don't forget about the um, Keelan Conference uh, 2015 that will be coming online. We do have a call for abstracts for uh, research presentations at the Keelan Conference that's currently out. Uh, the deadline is next week, um, so please um, consider submitting um, uh, your work to the conference. We can promise you another um, 
um, in a viable um, meeting uh, next April here here in Lexington. So we hope you'll um, be planning to join us for that. Um, we also have um, just to highlight some of the upcoming uh, webinars as part of this research and progress uh, session. We have one next week. Um, also, um, uh, continuing in this line of research on integration between public health and healthcare delivery, our uh, colleague um, uh, Eric Carlson and his, um, uh, his collaborators at the University of Memphis in, uh, in uh, uh, Tennessee. Uh, and then save a date for our um, upcoming um, January um, sessions that are scheduled uh, uh, on uh, the 7th and 14th and February as well. Stay tuned um, to uh, uh, the, uh, our email channel for uh, for, um, but we'll be announcing those, um, those speakers and content uh, shortly. So thanks, everybody, for joining us. And um, uh, don't hesitate to contact us with ideas, uh, thoughts, or, or more information about what you've heard today or about the larger uh, enterprise of public health services and systems research. Thanks so much, everybody.